Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini, sitting in for Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. We begin with Stephanie Scruggs, one of 13 children raised by a single mom. She started writing about five years ago when she retired after 35 years as a city bus driver in Chicago. The name of her book, Life on the Streets Without God and Education. We had to help my mother raise those smaller children. My father ran off and left, and after he left, uh, he tried to kill her, so he got away with it. And she ended up raising all of us on her own. We was combing hair, cutting hair, washing, cleaning, making sure the other kids got their homework done. And as I grew, I went to Job Corps when I was 15. And I didn't succeed in that. So six months later, I went back home. On my 19th birthday, I left East St. Louis, Illinois, and moved to Chicago. So when I got to Chicago, I'm thinking I was going to party, have a good time. No, I got saved and gave my life to God. I dropped out of high school in the 11th grade. So after I gave my life to God, I went back to school at Malcolm X College, Chicago, Illinois, started working on my GED and started taking courses. I had my major was computer science and did another year into the computer learning center and graduated. At the age of 21, I was called to the ministry. So we started doing street ministry and I started seeing things that I did not like. I never saw people on the street before because I'm from a little small town, East St. Louis, and we didn't have people sleeping on the street, hanging out, on corners, and it kind of shocked me to have to, to see that. At the age of 23, I started evangelizing. I left Chicago in 1984, and my first trip out was Dallas, Texas. So we used to go up under the bridge and feed these people every weekend, and I watched them get up, come eat, take them a little nap, get up, go back in the streets, drinking drug all night, the next day come back and get another meal. I said, this don't make sense to me. And I, the name of the book came to me when I went to Dallas, Life on the Streets Without God and an Education. And I am started thinking, you know, this is a price you have to pay if you don't go to school and get uh, an education and a double price you have to pay if you don't have God. So that's how that book came along. Wow, what a story, Stephanie. What a story. Even on the bus, one night, this young girl got on my bus about 2 in the morning. I was on my last run taking that bus to the garage. So she said, ma'am, can I get on? Uh, I don't have no money. I looked at her. I said, come on, how old are you? She said 18, and I called her to the front. I said, come in, ma'am. Come up here and sit here. I said, what are you doing out here in the streets, drunk and high on drugs, 2 o'clock in the morning? I said, don't you know somebody will grab you, rape you, kill you, cut your body up, bury you somewhere, can't find you, nobody will never know what happened to you. She said, yes, ma'am. So I told her, I said, you got your high school diploma? She said, yes, ma'am. I went to job corps and I got it. I said, well, good. I said, did you come out of foster care? She said, yes, ma'am. I said, how many kids you got? She said, one little daughter, like a newborn, and her mother had it. I said, let me explain something to you. Do you ever let me catch you out here on these streets, on this bus, drunk and high again? So I told her, I said, I want you to go get your mom or go down to the unemployment office. They will help you set up a resume. They will help you get a job, a part-time job, and they will help you take some college courses until you figure out what you want to do. 
And I say, and what you can do is tap into Chicago Transit Authority and go in to be an agent to sit behind the booth uh, watching the people come in and come out, getting on the trains and monitoring the trains. Therefore, you can have your books with you. You can be studying while you monitoring the trains. And then you can get uh, help for babysitting, put the kid in daycare. So she said, oh, ma'am, I thank you, and I appreciate you. I seen her one time after that. She was at McDonald's with her cousin. She said, oh, my God, there go my bus driver. She showed me everything to do. She ran, and they grabbed and hugged me. I said, what's going on? She said, my mom is taking me down there Tuesday, and uh, I'm going to get everything set up. I said, well, thank you, and I appreciate it. And next time I see you, I want to hear some good news. I never seen her back on that bus or on them streets from that day to this that's been over two years ago making a difference in people's lives good for you yes yes i mean do you still go out on the streets oh uh, yes i do and i take my book with me all right stephanie thank you engineer inventor author environmentalist and teacher james titmus has published five books explaining how his experiments are teaching kids as young as six and seven about conservation of resources and how nature heals in this book the dusty water he's talking about silt something very unique to northern ohio one of the things that always fascinated me was uh, a lot of the uh, regulations that we comply with in a day-to-day basis and i've looked over Uh, some of the regulations that the Environmental uh, Protection Agency had put forth. And one of the things that always struck me odd was this business of putting up silt fences around construction sites. They even ask us to put us silt fences to protect the site, even where the ground goes up from the property. And some of these are pretty expensive. They can run $30,000, $40,000 a particular construction site. The silt fence business has only been around for about 20 plus years. But in all those years and all the projects I've done, I've never seen any silt captured by the silt fence. So in in my book, the children run a little experiment about the nature of the dust in the silt that washes from a construction site. And they are thinking in terms that the, the dust will settle in about a day. And three or four days later in their little experiment, it still hasn't settled. But the real lesson that I think we build into the books is that the children learn by experimentation and doing. And it takes quite a bit of imagination to simulate a real world process. But the children discover that lo and behold, after three days, the dust still hasn't settled. But more importantly, in the pond that they witnessed by the park that the fish and everything has adapted to the dust in the water and not having any problems at all. So there's a little bit of a lesson is learning how nature heals itself without spending some 30,000 or $40,000. And the real tragedy of it is, is that we all pay for the expenses of the commercial interest. So I think the situation is that a little education could go a really long way, but the important thing from an engineering standpoint, our obligation is to life health safety as an engineer, but also for the conservation of resources at the same time. And quite frankly, that amount of money could be spent on a lot of other things. We can only afford so much. We can afford anything, but we can't afford everything. So the children are looking into some lessons on the economics as well as uh, the environmental aspects. I want to leave the world cleaner than when I found it. You know, I am a bit of an environmentalist, and that goes for what we do in our engineering designs, too. So the children run an experiment and gather up a sample, take it home, and, and check it out. (laughs) <laughs> they sort of have to contrive or invent some of their apparatus to do that. But uh, we spell it out in the book, and that shows how it, uh, the learning experience comes to play. Could we recreate this experiment if we wanted to? Certainly. It's easy to do, and that's why it's spelled out in the book that way, that uh, any one person, say, between 
say seven or eight and 14 years old would easily be able to re replicate it, to do it themselves. Because the other thing, the point is that- Why is there so much silt in Ohio? Uh, it came from a glacier. It's a dust that blew off the glaciers. And up here in the northern eastern part of the state, these silt deposits are several hundred feet thick. So it's kind of a natural occurrence. Yes, it is. It's absolutely natural. And the, in the biota, in the streams and ponds, have actually grown used to it. And ironically, this, what washes off the construction sites is actually sand and gravel which the streams and ponds need for the fish to breed. Interesting, James. Thank you. What family doesn't have a favorite Christmas story, but sometimes it takes a special moment or person to inspire you to take the time to write about it? That's what happened to Aaron Shreve when he came up with the idea for the Christmas Unicorn Rescue. Christmas has always been very special to my family, especially my grandmother. Just a great time to be around family, like a lot of families, I'm sure. And when she passed away, my mom asked my family, my immediate family, to write something kind of about Christmas. And most of my family took the opportunity to just kind of write about memories. And I decided I was going to write a fiction. So my mom said, hey, this is really good. You should get it published. So we contacted Page Publishing, and here we are. So it's about a boy who hears something outside of his window a couple of days before Christmas. And when he goes to investigate it, he falls down a giant hole and that's really where the story gets into action. It's a place called Utopia, and there's a unicorn there that is lonely, and he runs into her, and come to find out, the unicorn, the reason why it's by itself, is her friends and family were kidnapped by an evil creature. So the boy proceeds to help her on her journey to get the friends and family back. A lot of magic and special imagination type things involved. Um, one of the things that I've gotten really good reviews about are when the boy lands in Utopia, there's what looks like snow floating around, but it never hits the ground. He tries to catch some in his mouth and come to find out it, whatever you're thinking of as far as food wise at that minute, that's what these little snowflakes called puff puffs taste like. So that was one of the most creative things of the story. Um, I've, I've never seen that anywhere else. I've never seen anybody come up with something where you catch something in your mouth and whatever you're thinking about at the time, it tastes like. So, oh, I love that. Uh, lots of imagination in there. Um, things like giant candy canes and just a lot of fun. I think it's a great read for all ages. You need to find children to read this to, to see how they like it. Yeah, we live in a community of about 800 and I'll have a reading there uh, closer to Christmas time. There's a Barnes and Noble in a town that's pretty close that I've been talking to the manager to get in for a reading there. Um, and then there's a lot of like unique little shops in our area, too, that I'm going to try to get in and um, advertise the book and then also maybe get some other readings. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Last night, in fact, we were out ran into some kids and I had a copy of the book and I just handed it to him and said, here, enjoy and pass it along and spread out, spread the word. I hope you like it. That's great. Does your mom love it? Yeah, she was really the inspiration. Aside from my grandmother being the inspiration for writing the story, my mom was the catalyst behind, hey, you should really get this published. And because um, I, you know, I, it's everybody kind of judges themselves differently. And I just thought it was a fun story and something I enjoyed doing and never really dreamed of getting it published until she she kind of pushed me into that. So um, I'm really happy I did. It, it was a fun process. And who knows, maybe maybe it'll turn into something where I pivot careers into being an author. You think you would write again? Will you write again? Yeah, I, I have always enjoyed writing. I've never really done anything fiction wise. It's always just kind of been, um, you know, writing about observations and things of that nature. But now that I've got a children's book under my belt, um, yeah, I'd be very interested in doing it again. A lot of my focus right now, though, has just been in kind of promoting the book and getting it out there. So, um, yeah, after this Christmas season, maybe we'll put pen to paper and get another one get another one out there. All right, Aaron, that's the spirit. And look who's on the line, Chris Blurton. Just talked to him about a month ago about more Doc 1, and here you are back with more Doc 2 already. How you doing? Hey, <laughs> it was actually a two-volume set. So where did we leave off with Mordock 1? So the Mordock are an ancient entity that has reached out. You know, the astronomers on Earth have made contact with, with the Mordock. But the Mordock, you know, they want to warn 
the the earthlings, that there's a dark force, which is the Persicon, that have come to destroy everything. They're, they're, they're on their way. And Mary Johansson, who is also an astronomer, uh, she's been studying a black hole, which is actually the vehicle for the Persicon to diverse the universe and uh, wreak havoc. And uh, they are on their way because they know the Mordok are, they're the only ones that they're intimidated by because the Mordok have the power and the knowledge in order to possibly throt their uh, their endeavors. The Chinese have made contact. They were the first ones to reach them, make contact with the Mordok, and the Mordok are with them. And then, of course, they're obviously um, on their way back to Earth. The Mordok 2 picks up from there and uh, continues on with the Americans and the Russians getting involved as well as far as eventually going to basically rescue the Chinese and the Mordok, and the adventure uh, continues from there. Okay. Now, you say that you give readers a bonus with this book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As I was writing, I came toward the, you know, the end of it. I realized that, you know, there actually could be two endings to this. So that's the exciting part. You actually have two completely different endings to at least for volume two. Is there going to be a volume three? Oh, yeah, three, four, five. (laughs) <laughs> How many ever I can, you know, there's, there's quite a quite a lot of storyline and, and there's, you know, there's enough strong characters and, and many spinoffs because I kind of leave it very open ended at the uh, either scenario that, you know, ends volume two. Of course, that <laughs> leaves everything kind of really still wide open. Right. Um, so what's nice is, you know, based on reviews, I've already received a, a good review from uh, online uh, book club dot org. And in the review, they did mention, you know, some characters in there, and that's that's good because uh, that kind of gives me some ideas for future volumes. Dmitri, Dmitri, he's a Russian astronomer, and he's a strong character in in both books, and uh, and his story is, you know, can easily continue on. Him and Vladimir, who's his boss, both of their stories are strong, and and you know, they can be spun off from there. All right, Chris, keep on spinning. I'll talk to you soon. Stock trader and rocket scientist in Bethesda, Maryland, Marshall H. Kaplan was an aerospace engineer professor at Penn State, a Lockheed Martin consultant, but he's here to talk about stocks and share how his method works in a home gamer's guide to financial independence, stock trading for retail investors. Oh, yeah, I have my own method. I, I'm actually a mathematician uh, by training and use my mathematical skills to analyze the market over the period of time, a long period of time, and uh, try different uh, methods. But um, I come up with a uh, process that actually does two things. It uh, minimizes the anxiety and the risk of trading, and it maximizes return at the same time. The market has so many variables that nobody really can predict what's going to happen at any given time. And so what I have done is I have taken the position and I'm going to ta- I'm going to get what the market will give me. I'm not going to force try and force the market. And so what I do is I play the market as it comes and I watch uh, individual stocks and I trade those stocks based on where they're going, whether they're going up or down. So when a stock goes up, I sell it. When a stock goes down, I buy it back. And I, I do that continuously or continually. And over a period of time, it, it beats the market by quite a bit. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Yeah, well, for example, uh, let's say I take a stock like Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin and many stocks uh, go up and down in a channel, so to speak. And so I take advantage of volatility. In other words, I take advantage of when stocks go up and down. So when, uh, when Lockheed Martin, for example, is low, it's a good stock. When it's low, relatively low, I, I would buy some shares. And then when it goes up uh, more than 3 or 4%, I would sell it. And then I would wait for it to come down again. When it comes down again, I'd buy it back. So I, I buy and sell the same stock. So I, I, but I, I deal in about 100 stocks and I watch about 100 stocks and all those stocks are, are valuable and, and good stocks. I don't, I, don't trade any, I don't trade any weak stocks. I don't trade any dollar stocks. Uh, I trade stocks that are, represent uh, solid companies, so to speak. And so by doing that, I'm, I minimize my risk. I don't, I don't do anything that's risky. Like I don't, I don't short sell. I don't buy and sell options. I don't, I don't try and arbitrage. I simply buy and sell common stocks. So do you share all of the stocks that you deal in? Is that part of your book? No. No? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I specifically don't give specific advice because uh, when you do that, they really don't know how to handle it because everybody has a different method. So 
if I were to take a stock and look at it, I would look at it a different way than somebody else would look at it. So each individual trader has to develop his own method. And that's the only way it works. If you try and use somebody else's method, it usually doesn't work. You know, there's so many books out there about how to make yourself rich, you know, how to invest, how to play the stock market. What, what's, what's your secret ingredient there? Well, I would say the secret ingredient is this. I take advantage of all the modern techniques of online brokerages, free trades uh, in terms of buying and selling stocks. And I also take advantage of all the data and information that's available online and through uh, watching like CNBC and other other uh, financial outlets like that. And I, I analyze what they're saying. I, then I when I, I get a few stock tips, I look over the stocks, uh, stocks are, and I I uh, investigate each stock that I, that I trade individually, analyze it with my own methods using fundamentals, basically fundamentals, uh, which means uh, the value of the company, how good the company is. And then I also look at the at the price price history of the stock as it goes up and down. So I keep it very simple. I, I don't worry about the uh, about the major stock market. I, you know, I can't control the, the stock market itself. The stock market is too many big players, you know, financial institutions and so on. So so they, they really control the market. So I'm not trying to control the market. I'm trying to control my shares. And that's all I do. Is it true that you should, you know, have a little a little stash of money set aside that you should be prepared to lose? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. De- definitely. Uh, I actually always keep uh, what I call dry powder. I keep a certain amount of money, 10 or 10 to 20 percent of my portfolio is in cash at, at all times. I didn't really write the book to make a lot of money. I wrote the book to see if I could explain what I'm doing. (laughs) All right, Marshall. Thank you. Dexter B. Lewis Jr. is spending the rest of his life behind bars for murder. And he tries to shine a light on the shadows of confinement in his book, The Caged Bird Syndrome, Life After Life, Volume 1. This is one way to make the best of it because I have two daughters and, you know, a devoted wife. And it's hard for incarcerated people to make meaningful contributions to their family, you know, in prison. Um, 100% of the proceeds are going to my wife and kids. And that's why I'm just uh, trying to do my best, you know, be better every day for them. Obviously, the Lord gifted me with abilities to create art and poetry and, you know, nonfiction narratives and being able to shine a, a a light on my trials and tribulations in this experience, I believe has potential to, you know, impact change within other incarcerated people's lives, but also just with people who really don't understand what we go through, the highs and lows of, you know, being a son, a father, incarcerated, being a husband. There's different aspects to, you know, to this life that, you know, we struggle through. Um, that really have potential to, you know, shift the narrative of what it means to be incarcerated in America. So Case Birth Syndrome, Life After Life, is a creative nonfiction featuring original art and poetry by Dexter Bernard Lewis Jr. And initially, Case Birth Syndrome was a poem that I wrote for an LCF Poetry Slam contest, the Lyman Correctional Facility. And so the, the concept evolved into an allegorical representation of my soul being restrained to a cage of flesh revealed through the foresight of an incarcerated person. But like, as I began to write life after life, I was like, like trying to put in context what it means to, I guess, die to the world and and be born in the system and have like, have to start a life from the time you're sentenced to possibly discharge or expiration. But, you know, just seeking redemption is, really the common denominator after after being condemned to, you know, die in prison, so to speak. It's my story, and it's a creative nonfiction, so it's an unconventional approach um, to telling my story, right? So in some places, I'm speaking in second. Some places, it's, it's poetic. You know, I'm using metaphors and similes to convey a message. But there's an impulse from beginning to, to current, whereas why case birth syndrome became a theme when I fell on this case and what I was going through from the time of falling to coming to this path. And so it's an, it's an ongoing process, right? Like sanctification. And currently speaking, I have 33 new pieces of art to the next work. And uh, we're we're just picking up from the end of um, life after life. So what do these pieces of art look like? I get inspirations from different sources 
just because of how I was raised. So I'm, I'm black male, but you know, I, I, I really don't have anyone to look up to as far as that type of art. So it, it, you know, it's a combination of the culture and my spirituality and, you know, just the diversity in my own life that, that are conveying messages. So, so you might have abstract creative art, some realism, surrealism, some landscape, you know, but everything is conveying a, a particular message about me or about my circumstances or my, my observations on just life. Most of my early works are drawings. And then I started painting uh, about four years ago. And so I got into acrylic and then now it's basically oil and acrylic on canvas, canvas panels. Or How many volumes will there be? Um, <laughs> I am shooting for three. I'm about 80% with two. The art is complete. The work is it's coming to a close. And then we'll start the editing process on that probably within the next six months. And uh, what I would like to do is actually put a totally a total revised version of volume one and volume two. So contributors won't have to go and grab different different works in, in the future. All right, Dexter, good luck. Maggie Muscardi left California to be with her grandson, and it's also why she wrote her book, Blue Earth, Blue Sky. When I was a kid, I grew up in Queens. You know, I remember the winters having lots of snow, the snowstorm of 69, and the ice storms we used to have in the winter time, and uh, just not like that anymore. We have crazy weather now, and I wanted to make sure he knew that it wasn't always this way. We we had winter and winter and summer and summer. <laughs> and the extremes of the weather now have just not been something that I could just sit back and not talk about with my grandson. So how do you lay out the story? Well, we're doing, you know, grandma, nana, and grandson stuff of going to the park and having ice cream. And his ice cream keeps uh, melting. And our dog, Peanut, keeps licking it. And he's asking me, Nana, why is it so hot? And I get him the story of, well, it wasn't always hot like this. And um, we go sit under a tree to get some a little shade and we get transported to another world. When I was young, I used to read Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues. And I said, what if we could go to a magical place where there were homes where the outside were like the way that the leaves do the transfer of oxygen and help us to breathe better. And then plants and water would come off the buildings naturally to feed, you know, the ground and us ourselves and recycle all the bad air. So the, think of the roofs of every single building could be used to have plants and things and just bringing nature back to the concrete jungle that we all live in now. And uh, we have cars that give out soap bubbles and they have these little uh, solar panels to make them work. So instead of fumes, we have bubbles? Exactly. And then the best one yet is the Recyclotron, where everybody, wherever you live, imagine a giant printer that you share in your community. You bring your junk, whatever you don't need, it goes through the Recyclotron and you say, hey, I need a new chair out pops the new chair out the other end. And so, you know, we recycle what we need where we are rather than sending it off to landfills and so on. And so I'm just wanting people to think outside the box and especially our youth because they're the future. And I want them to dream bigger dreams and, and help us save us from ourselves. Well, I mean, do they stay in this place or do they have to come back? Well, I mean, that's really up to your imagination at that point. Do you really think we should come back if we have such a magical world that everything is so much better? I don't know. I wouldn't want to come back. I just want to stay there. And the hope and the dream is that, you know, basically with each of us taking great care, ingenuity and repurposing, we can make the earth happy again. And that's how the story ends. My grandson, Ari, and little Peanut, they run to the, um, 
the jungle gym that was made by the Recyclotron. And that's the last page of the book. Oh, Maggie, I want to go there. I want to go to that place. Thank you so much. Teresa Giusti is an attorney for the Rhode Island Ethics Commission and during the height of the pandemic, finally found time to write and used her kids and her cats as inspiration for furry friends teach a lesson. This particular book, let's put it this way, I've always wanted to write a book and I've always wanted to have one published. Um, it was always, always been a dream of mine. But during the pandemic, so I have two kids. I have a 12-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. They're in the book. And I was an only child growing up. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to have more than one, because I hated being an only child. Then I had two. And I said, oh, I have a boy and a girl. This is great. And when they were toddlers, they got along great, played together. And then the reality set in as they got a little bit older and the sibling rivalry set in. I, I figured my kids were off the chart bad or I was some terrible mother because why are they fighting all the time? And then I started talking to other parents. So I realized it's very common. It's very normal. Anyway, we had two cats, an older cat, Mia, and a younger cat, Muffin. So when Muffin came into the family, he was very young. And Mia was older, and it was interesting to watch their dynamic. They did not get along for a long time. And even towards the end, before my older cat passed, they learned to tolerate each other. And so during the pandemic, as I'm observing this, I said, I wonder if there's a way that I could put this into a story where I parallel the relationship between the kids and their interactions with the cats and kind of make it into like a children's story. And I said, I'm going to try to put this in a, um, in a book format. And it kind of flowed. And then I said, maybe we can teach a little tiny lesson in the process. So it's Muffin and Mia, the two cats. It starts with them. And Mia comes first. She was an older cat. But then, you know, we decided to get a second. So we got Muffin. He's a ragdoll cat. And um, so he was a baby and Mia was older. And the kids were so disappointed at how they didn't get along, fighting, um, Mia hissing at him. I think at the beginning, Muffin just wanted to play with her and, you know, maybe even make friends. But Mia just didn't want anything to do with it. Again, kind of like siblings. I discuss how then Alex and Emmy, my children, also have times when they don't get along. But then eventually... Muffin and Mia start learning to tolerate each other. So, for example, one scene in the book, they're sleeping kind of near each other on a bed. And the kids are all excited because they see them getting along or at least being in each other's company as opposed to attacking each other. And that kind of gets the kids excited. They're sharing the experience together. And towards the end of the book, mom, you know, kind of shows to the kids See, this is not very unlike you, the two of you, and how you get along. But, you know, we always have to learn to, to love each other, even if we don't get along all the time. And that's basically how it ends. Um, I did donate a copy to my daughter's elementary school. So she, and, um, the principal and a couple of the teachers loved the book and actually recommended that. I know the teachers have read it to their students. And it's not about sales or anything, but I... I would just like to see if it's if it's well accepted at all and well received, that would encourage me. I mean, certainly you don't want to write if, <laughs> I mean, I can write for myself, I can write for my kids, but to, you know, to um, publish again and go through that, as much as I love the process, it would be encouraging if this does decently well, you know. Yep, everybody listening right now knows exactly what you're talking about, Teresa. Thank you. Sandy Foreman is a realtor in California who wrote her first book about her battle with cancer 13 years ago. Her latest is a children's book entitled Bella's Adventure, a personal adventure where Bella finds courage and inspiration. I had been a uh, Sunday school teacher, and I was always looking for a children's book that had meaning to them and a lesson of some sort. And my book would just fit into that if I were still doing it, but I'm not doing Sunday school anymore. But I kind of, just out of the blue, my granddaughter, who is 22, and she is also the illustrator of this book, 
this is a true story about a cat that got out and who she met along the way. And so that's what inspired me was for her to tell me, oh, Bella got out and we were all night looking for her and trying to find her. And so for some reason, it just hit me. That is a darling story because she gets back safe and sound. She meets little critters along the way and they guide her back to get out of the ivy patch she was in. So it was it was just delightful to write. And so she illustrated it, and the illustrations are just fantastic. When you open the book, it is um, the back door open and Bella looking out. And so she is curious because she's a house cat, and somebody had left that slider open. And then she just keeps wandering and wow, looking at the big world that she hadn't known before. So some way or another, she finds this ivy patch next door to her house. She got over the fence and she gets into the ivy patch. And that's where she meets these little critters, an ant and a spider and a snail. And they talk to her and encourage her that she can find her way back home. She's scared because this is a totally strange place and it's very dark in the ivy and she's never seen these critters before so she doesn't know who they are or if they're safe but they were so nice to her and helping her and telling her encouraging her that she could find her way out so and she does and she's got her other house cat is an old very old cat i think he's going on 20 his name is gatito and they're good buddies and so gatito comes and finds her, he can hear her, and I guess smell her, and uh, and he tells her, Bella, just follow my voice, you can get out, and she does. It ends with them sitting on, out on the patio on this chair together. So in the morning, Christina looks out the window and saw Bella and Gatito snuggled together on a chair, both looking happy and content, and we did a uh, I belong to published writers of Rossmore, and we did a uh, bazaar, anything that anybody created. In our, our club, our published writers, we had so many authors there, and uh, so I presented it uh, there. That's great, Sandy. Good for you. Yvonne Brown is a retired New York City public school teacher who now has time to write about her life in Jamaica. This is her second book for Paige, entitled Short Stories. I wrote this story according to how I have lived in Jamaica. I'm originally from Jamaica. And from my experience, so I weave it with a little fiction and, you know, real life story so that gave me the um idea to write my book and since but ever since i was about 11 or 12 i always dream of becoming a teacher a doctor and then to become a writer and it seems as if my dream has been fulfilled because i became a teacher i retired and now i'm writing and this is my third book which has been published it's a couple of stories. And is the common thread to never stop dreaming? Right. Never stop dreaming. Always dream and never stop dreaming. Dreams help you to realize your goals in life. And you have to believe in yourself and let your thoughts be positive at all times. Are the short stories related? No, they're not related at all. They are different. One of them is about the dreamer. It's a little girl who dreamt, uh, who lived in a faraway country, who dreamed of, um, about going to the United States of America. She wanted to, to have a good education and become rich. And after she graduated from high school, she went to the United States of America. She came here. She went to a dance, met a man. They fell in love, got married. And uh, and then she went to college and graduated and she became a teacher. That sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. How many stories are there? Let's see. About 18 stories. Different stories. About 18. Yes. What's your favorite story? My favorite story is The Dreamer. 
And that's you. That's me. I dreamed of, the, of coming to the United States, and I did come to the United States. My dream came true, and I met a man. I got married, and I am happy living happily ever after. Unfortunately, my husband passed seven years ago, but I am still happy. I have good memories of him. You know, we had a lovely marriage. We were married for 26 years. Nice. Aw. And um, yes, so I have very good memories of him. Ah, Yvonne, I love your enthusiasm. Thank you. Robert Wemauer was an officer and aviator in the U.S. Marine Corps and went on to become an environmental project manager. He wanted to thank the people who helped him along the way and motivate young people to succeed no matter what. The name of his book, Unlike No Other, a memoir of the unlikely yet successful career of a United States Marine Corps aviator, book one. People who helped me succeed in most cases worked tirelessly and never received the recognition that they deserved. I wanted to recognize these people in a formal manner and document their contribution to the Marine Corps and to our country. Secondly, I wanted to provide an example to young people that they can overcome obstacles in their life and to exceed if they have the desire, drive, and determination to make it happen. My, my two-book memoir contains stories about my Marine Corps career that range in intensity from combat conditions during my first three combat tours in the Vietnam War to a unique escape and evasion training experience, along with describing the various leadership challenges and achievements in both command positions as well as the Marine Corps headquarters assignments during my 25 years in the United States Marine Corps. There are numerous, uh, both civilians and military uh, people uh, in the book that uh, have helped me. My mother was working at the University of Chicago uh, at uh, Navy Pier when I was uh, carried and born, and that was right on top of the nuclear testing that was going on. So I ended up with uh, a number of problems associated after my birth. I had an extra finger, and I had a scoliosis in my back, and I was uh, underweight. And uh, so Moving from that point through the process of having those type of afflictions and being uh, picked on, bullied, if you will, uh, and uh, with eye problems uh, that kept me from reading uh, very well until about the sixth grade, you know, not being able to catch up, sort of started me out from the the low end of the totem pole and for me to be able to succeed the people along the way uh, helped me an awful lot the coach that i had in high school did a uh, marvelous job of inspiring me to uh, get out and uh, work hard along with my father to uh, become a person who was in sports and move along through the process of trying to play catch up for me to become a Marine Corps officer and then a naval aviator was, in a lot of people's estimation, a phenomenal achievement. It is phenomenal. I, just the fact that you had problems with your eyesight, I mean, that knocks people out right there, doesn't it? Yeah, it normally does, yeah. And you have to have perfect vision to become a naval aviator. And by the time I got there, they had corrected the problems with my uh, eyesight. Actually, the muscles in my eyes were not developed enough to hold my eye steady long enough to read more than three uh, letters uh, at a time. And uh, so I got, I had some problems in elementary school. I tell you, the, the most difficult time that I had uh, writing the memoir was remembering my Marine brothers that I lost in combat through combat and accidents one of which uh, cost the life of one of my crew members, for which I'll always be uh, sorry. However, the most memorable part of uh, writing the memoir was remembering the people who helped me succeed. That was the most rewarding part of writing the memoir. You are an inspiration on so many levels. Are you able to share your story? Uh, I am uh, currently uh, visiting uh, with the uh, reunion 
groups, uh, Papa Smoke, uh, which is a helicopter and air crew reunion association, and also uh, doing uh, some speaking at uh, local uh, schools uh, in uh, the area. That's great, Robert. Thank you so much. For Ali Majin, running is life, and he details why he runs, how he runs, the benefits he gets from running, and why you should do it too in his book, The Running Journey. Yes, yeah. I run a lot uh, on my own every day when I can, and I ran about 92 full marathons, 62 half marathons, five ultra marathons, and one 50K. Wow. Yeah, and I, I enjoy running, and that inspired me to write and share my feelings with others. And When did you start running? Uh, I started running when I was probably nine or 10 years old, and then I did a 10K Uh, with my dad. 2007 was my first marathon that I did. It was with the AIDS Marathon Training Program. And I did a training for them for about six months in Griffith Park and started to do races ever since then. And I've kind of increased it within the last few years. And you've never had any knee issues or hip issues or back issues? Uh, Every now and then, my shins kind of got a little swollen. I had to learn to take a little bit of a break. Knee issues, not really. And back issues every now and then my back is is okay. Sometimes after long races, yeah, it can hurt, but not, not recently. I've been conditioning pretty well so that I'm keeping that to a minimum. The book is about the races I've done. It's the plot is about how to learn to run, how to run better and improve my pace through an enjoyable story. So the reader does and should learn the self-improvement and how to see themselves healthier, to overcome the challenge of running marathons and encourage people to run marathons. And it's a lot about the races that I've done, participating in the Series Runner Challenge. It's a series where they have up to 500 miles in a year. And I did it. The first year I completed the challenge was with about 20 races. That was two years ago. Last year, I had about 524 miles. This year, I'm up to 500 miles. And in addition, I run a lot of other races outside that series. So it's kind of going from childhood to adulthood, the book, and and from improving pace, finding more appreciation and in, in running, getting medals, and make it, it into my daily life. And it's a, it's a lot about enjoying myself while I'm running too, giving myself that motivation, having my health improve throughout time. The main, main idea is just that the journey of running through the self-improvement and the things I've learned. So with self-improvement, I, the main character is myself. The other runners and the running community and the f- f- for many professionals and family. So when I'm mentioning the, the stories about uh, how to improve pace through consistent training and with the examples of the different runs that how I've learned through each race to improve the pace quicker, like for example, the uh, San Francisco ultra marathon, I mentioned that I've had some challenges when I, when I've, ran it the first few times and then from there it's just that I just grow as a person and talk with like the the race director his name was Michael Lee I talked with a lot of other runners beforehand and giving myself that motivation I kind of paint it into a story of how the the reader can for themselves improve themselves so those are big events and it's really an accomplishment to do something like that and I mentioned that in the book Ali, it is an accomplishment. I can't get past the boredom of running. So I I do. I give you a lot of credit. For the past 11 years, Yahweh Righteousness has dedicated his life to proving God's existence and shares his journey in Jordan B. Peterson's impenetrable language revealed by Yahweh. Starting at age 11, Baptist pastor, he asked me, did I believe in God and believe that Jesus died for our sins? I said, yes. I was a naive 11-year-old, didn't know what I was saying. He said, okay, you're saved since we said yes. We got baptized that morning. I was laying in my bed, an 11-year-old. Looking up at the ceiling, I couldn't sleep and oppressed and saying, if I die, I'm going to hell. Nothing like that had ever happened to me in my life. And I'll fast forward to 2011, and I had been baptized from 11 to in my lower 40s three more times trying to serve and find this God that he said I was saved back at 11. And in 2011, I came to the point where I said to God, I've been looking for you since I was 11, and I've come to the conclusion that if you are real, you're just as big a liar as I am. 
And he showed up for me in a burning bush when I stopped listening to what man was telling me and listened to what the word of God said, he immediately showed up. And I know that I'm not the only one that's ever had God experiences, but the question is, what do you do afterwards? Because do you keep on going and finding out all the mess that this world is in, or do you stop? Well, I was chosen not to stop. And that's what my book is about. My book is also evidence. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, he has different videos saying he didn't see any evidence of God. Well, up until 2011, I didn't either. And this is my evidence. It's a little 48-page book that describes an impenetrable language that uh, Jordan B. Peterson, along with Camille Pegla in Modern Times video, they speak of this impenetrable language around the 24-minute mark. They start talking about it. An impenetrable language of the left with a set of linguistic tools. Well, the Word of God and the strong Concordance numbering system is the tools of this language. They script out what to say and say these specific words at specific times, and you can you can start hearing what they're saying if you go to like BibleHub.com where all the there's Greek lexicons, Brown Driver Briggs, and so forth. But you can hear this language just like a TV show that you they write out the script, the actors learn their part. And they speak it, and they edit it, and it just falls into place. It's a mocking tongue that Isaiah 33, 19 and other places says. Because of God's people being, well, we were led away from serving God and listening to his word, that he would send this fierce nation with an obscure speech, a mocking tongue that you don't understand. And that's part of what my bread of adversity and word of affliction started when I was 11, again, a the pastor saying that to me and all through my life I couldn't I didn't know what was up and what was down and what what I was or what God was and it said though I give you the bread of adversity and the water of afflictions your teachers won't be hid in the corner anymore for your eyes will see them well Jordan B. Peterson Neil deGrasse Tyson movie stars such as the book of Eli they're speaking to me they're my teachers and they're also my witnesses so Neil deGrasse Tyson doing this Not only is he my teacher, but he's my witness because when I tell him and show him this is the evidence that you do what I say, he can't deny that. He will have to admit this is what I do. This is what I was destined to do, just like I was destined to change my name. All right, Yahweh, thank you so much. And we hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.